Stanford University. Uh, good afternoon. Welcome to the uh, Computer Systems uh, Colloquium. Uh, today we are hosting the uh, Computer Science uh, Distinguished Lecturer talk. Um, before we start, I want to uh, uh, tell you a little bit about what's going on. Uh, thank you for all coming and watching the uh, talk live. You will be able to see the videos. Those of you who are out in TV land, you'll be able to watch the speaker but you won't see the videos. So some of the videos are uh, uh, not things which we feel comfortable broadcasting. Um, so in any case, this is the reason you, we, we urge everyone to come to, uh, uh, to these talks live rather than watching them over the net. Um, the introduction today will be done by Christian Lagerman. No, Sebastian. Uh, you're going to be doing it, Sebastian. Yeah. I see. Yes, Sebastian has changed. Uh, his you know, program has changed. No one told me. <laughs> and uh, so you're on. <laughs> this is your <coughs> microphone. Hook it up and uh, enjoy the talk. Well, it's a really great pleasure to me to uh, introduce one of the legends of robotics to our colloquium. Um, Mark Raybert is, has written more about robotic history than almost anybody I know. Um, in fact, a personal episode when I joined Carnegie Mellon as a visiting student, I ended up in the lab that he ran for a long time just after leaving Carnegie Mellon. And there was a lot of yellow tape over the floor, which I think he used for his initial work on Leggett uh, robotics. Mark has shown the world that Leggett systems can be dynamically stable. They don't have to balance themselves at any point in time. He's developed, built one-legged machines, two-legged machines, four-legged machines, and many-legged machines. Uh, he took a little detour, went to a small college in Boston, whose name I forgot, and then ended up starting a company um, called Boston Dynamics. In Boston Dynamics, um, he did a lot of work on simulation, mostly for military customers, and then went back to robotics and built some of the most influential legged machines on the planet. Uh, Big Dog is one of them. We're going to hear about this. Little Dog, which we have at Stanford, is another one. And he's been just really inspiring uh, to show people what is possibly in terms of legged dynamics and locomotion. There's a huge field of legged robotics in Japan, which is mostly statically stable, and in my opinion, really lags behind any inspiration that Mark has brought to the field. So it's a really big pleasure to have one of the true pioneers of robotics with us, and thank you so much for coming. Well, thanks for that, uh, that nice introduction, Sebastian. So uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, some robots we've been building. Uh, Big Dog, a follow-on to Big Dog, which we haven't built yet, uh, Pet Man, and maybe some others. And, uh, you know, one of the things that's uh, exciting about this field for me is I feel like for the first time I can see some light at the end of the tunnel. And uh, by that I mean, you know, for years I did work on, uh, well, one-legged hopping machines, funny contraptions in the lab. And, you know, they were, they were fun, they were interesting, uh, but it was really like kicking the scientific can just a little bit down the road. And we never even thought about the idea that the robot could get out in the world and actually be used for something. And we're not to the point where that's true for the ones we're building, but the number of remaining problems that need to get solved seem, you know, it's a small list and it's kind of a mostly manageable list. And so it's very exciting that I can imagine over the next couple of years getting uh, legged robot technology, something that's been really a backwater niche, uh, it could get far enough along so that these machines could uh, get out there and into use. And so it's kind of fun uh, in sort of the <coughs> later years of one car one's career to get reinvigorated by, uh, by that vision and, and really hope. Um, so I thought I would start out with a little demonstration. The title of the talk is Rough Terrain Robots, so I thought I should show you some rough terrain. So here's, here's some rough terrain, and here's a legged system. <laughs> and the amazing thing about legged systems, even though that's a relatively small system compared to the terrain, they can reconfigure themselves <laughs> and uh, maneuver quite adeptly uh, over the terrain <laughs> and do target acquisition and then get on with whatever there is they're going to do. And one of the interesting things about uh, uh, 
uh, this kind of a system, is that it can use the parts of the terrain that are the best parts of the terrain. Like on this side of, of uh, that's me, on this side of me it's flat and the, the uh, uh, Matthew got support by using the flat part. And then over on my belly there, well it used to be mostly flat, but uh, they could get support by pressing there. And the vertical part of the terrain at the very edge of my body where it's very steep and there's no traction, they just skip that. So a legged system can choose the best available footholds that, we're in, that are within reach in order to maximize their likelihood of being able to traverse the terrain. Where wheeled things get hung up on the worst regions in the terrain. That's probably not the only reason why legs are good, but it's, uh, it's uh, one thing. Well, I've been, for years, been inspired by what, uh, what legged systems uh, uh, can do. And here's um, a little bit of that inspiration. Here are uh, mountain goats. Uh, one of those mountain goats is very young, probably, probably isn't a year old. And uh, these animals can just go just about everywhere. And they move dynamically uh, with grace. There's nothing like static stability uh, visible in these animals. Uh, this animal <coughs> is probably taking its whole life in it, into its hooves when it walks on this very steep terrain, balancing itself. It uses its nose right there, it looks like, for, for some of the support. And, uh, you know, the strength and agility and, uh, and uh, control, uh, probably perception, uh, at work here is just, uh, it's got to be inspiring for those of us who uh, seek to build machines that can do this sort of stuff. Of course, it's also daunting. You know, we don't have anything close to that performance yet, and I don't know when we will, uh, but that's what I dream about uh, working towards. Now, one of the reasons we want systems that can go in rough terrain is to be able to help this guy carry all that stuff. Basically, soldiers and Marines and other people on foot have no mechanized way to help them carry stuff when they go into the mountains uh, or anywhere where wheeled and tracked vehicles can't go. And that's basically most of the earth is still inaccessible to existing vehicles. So the hope is that we could build systems with legs that go to those places. Um, the US military already knows that legs are good. This is a, a picture from a LA Times story last year from a training uh, camp that the Marines run where they teach Marines to handle mules uh, carrying stuff uh, basically on their way to uh, Afghanistan and other places like that. I think there's a myth, of, so now I'm going to try and make some arguments why a robot would be better than a mule. And this is really a losing proposition, I have to tell you, because uh, for many cases, the, you know, the mules already, uh, or mules or donkeys, have a great deal of a capability, and it'll be a long time since we can replace that. They're nice and quiet. Uh, they don't actually carry that big a load. Uh, for sustained operation, they can carry about a third of their body weight, uh, which is impressive, but not that impressive, I think. Um, another problem with the mule is that they, you can't really send them ahead and reliably expect them to go where you've told them and take maybe commands over the radio. I don't think they're too good at that. Um, and another thing is the logistics of a mule. Uh, even though they don't eat much when you're in an operation, you kind of have to keep them fed all the time. So suppose it's um, a year in, uh, in between uh, use and you have the, uh, the mule in the warehouse. You can't just put it on a shelf and leave it. You have to tend it the whole time. Or Go find yourself new mules and train them. Whereas a robot system, uh, you could turn it off, package it up, and then deploy it, and then uh, turn it on again. So rather than introduce Big Dog myself, I thought I would get some help. Uh, this is one of the videos that you probably shouldn't broadcast, but if you could put on the, the sound the from my computer, that would be nice. Thing.
that we've been developing for the last uh, four or five years. This is actually version three. There were a couple others before, but this is the current one. And uh, it's obviously it's got four legs, and there's uh, actuators in each leg. There's four hydraulic actuators in each leg. Uh, the hydraulics are powered by, let's see, the, the power is delivered by an engine. This is a go-kart engine that's hooked up directly to a hydraulic variable displacement pump. It's the kind of pump that you get from uh, the aircraft community used for APUs and things like that. And it's, the pump is very efficient and compact, and you can generate uh, high-pressure fluid uh, with very little loss. And then the legs have actuators in them. Uh, there's five joints in each leg with four actuators. These are the hydraulic actuators that have a position sensor, and there's a, a load cell, and there's a high-performance servo valve. And the cool thing about these actuators are that they're back-drivable. They have very high power-to-weight ratio. They weigh about two pounds and can deliver about uh, 1,200 uh, watts. Uh, because they're hydraulic, they're cooled centrally, so all the... Uh, the heat that would be generated by an electric motor is, uh, is not there. It's, it's taken away to a centralized cooling place. And there's no gearbox. These things push directly on the joint or onto a, a limited amount of linkage in the joint. And so it means that it's a very weight, uh, lightweight, uh, high-performance type of uh, thing. It's funny that uh, when I talk about hydraulics, especially to computer scientists, uh, I think uh, your eyes roll back into the back of your head, or you think I must be kind of old-fashioned, which maybe I am. Uh, but it's really, I think it's an up-and-coming technology. Because something that, all the, almost all the hydraulic technology was developed 30 or even 50 years ago for aircraft. And uh, there weren't computers then, or there weren't computers available to apply directly to the hydraulics. And I think we're going to have a new... Uh, revolution in how hydraulics work by putting in more sophisticated valving systems and providing some computation right at the actuator. I'm not going to really talk about that theme, but it's sort of one of my hobby horses. No. Although there is a thing called red oil that's used in uh, some aircraft. Uh, um, there's a computer on board. It's it's kind of a ordinary computer. It's a uh, uh, it's just a PC, uh, about, a, um, about 2 gigahertz. Um, there's nothing very exotic about it. Uh, that computer uh, tests all the sen uh, gets data from all the sensors, does communications with operators, and it also does all the real-time balance and control of the robot as it's running. There's about 50 sensors on Big Dog that are broken down into three categories. There's the proprioceptive sensors built into the legs that are used to measure the kinematics, the, in other words, the positioning of legs and the forces that the legs, that the actuators exert on their linkages and indirectly the forces that are delivered to the environment. Um, and there's also a gyro that's part of that proprioceptive system. Some people think of the gyro as part of the proprioceptive or the internal sensing system. Some people think of it as sensing the robot's relation to the world. But anyway, there is a, a gyro on there. A second category of sensors are sensors that look out at the surroundings of the robot. There's uh, a LIDAR that looks out the front that scans the environment. There's a uh, stereo pair that looks right in front of the robot. Um, I think you could call GPS uh, a world sensing sensor. And then again, the gyro could either be in this or uh, as part of the proprioceptive sensors. And then there's a third set of sensors that are kind of like homeostasis. That is, what's the internal operation of the machinery in the robot? And it worries about the engine temperature and RPM and the oil pressures and all that kind of internal stuff that you need to manage. But it's, you know, it's, not, quite a, it's not a rich problem to, uh, to worry about dealing with all that stuff. But the same computer worries about all that. So what about the controls? Um, we, we came at the big dog problem thinking that the controls was the most important part of the problem to deal with and the one that we were sort of the most excited about uh, embracing. Uh, and for big dog in particular, getting rough terrain locomotion that works not just in the laboratory, but out in the field where there's 
an unknown environment, a variable environment, uh, was uh, the challenge that we wanted to uh, take on. And we started with some simple concepts that came from uh, earlier work on the one-legged hopping machines that Sebastian mentioned and, and other things like that. And there we, we focused on perf breaking down the whole control problem of this uh, 20 jointed system down into simple manageable parts. Uh, one part was to worry about supporting the body of the robot, that is providing a counteraction to gravity that would keep the body supported no matter what the legs were doing. A second part of the control worried about balancing the robot so that as it moves, it wouldn't tip over, either tip over when it was disturbed or even just tip over during the normal locomotion process. You notice that when, here, I'm going to do some demonstrations. I'm going to walk. Okay, you've all seen that before, right? Well, when, when you walk, there are times when your center of mass is not located over your support point. So you really would just tip over if you weren't planning out what you're doing with your legs. And when I walk, I tip over this leg, but then I get my other leg ready to catch myself. And you can actually use inverted pendulum type models to analyze uh, this kind of behavior. A simple inverted pendulum <coughs> has a mass and a support point, and the rules of keeping it balanced are to keep the support point under the mass. In fact, you don't have to keep it under the mass all the time. You could keep the point of support on an, uh, its average position under the average position of the center of mass, and that's what I'm doing when I walk. It's also what I do when I run, or here, I'll, I'll, I'll hop, okay? So when I hop, I don't have continuous support. And when I run, it's the same thing. So the inverted pendulum in the simple form, where you have to keep the point of support under the mass, doesn't really apply. But if you look at the averages, uh, then that explains how to get balance. So we use a, uh, a model of that kind of average point of support and create a symmetry in the motion of the robot so that the motion of the body has a symmetric pattern of travel over the point of support so that its average is the same as the uh, point of support. Now it's easy to describe that for one-legged systems when you get lots of legs, there's a lot of bookkeeping to do that, but the same rules really apply. And then a third part of the control is one that keeps the body's orientation in space the way it's desired. We call it upright, so for a person you want your trunk upright most of the time, Although I can, I'm perfectly able to walk bent over. Um, a horse or a dog has its body horizontal when it, uh, when it walks and, uh, or runs. And whereas it may look like it's just statically that way, the control system really has to maintain that. So part of the controls are focused on maintaining the attitude of the body in our systems. So we start with these three goals and then break down the degrees of freedom of the control to be to be trying to achieve these. So I'm going to give a quick run through of how that looks for uh, a quadruped. So this is a, a slightly earlier version of, uh, of Big Dog. And in order to maintain the posture, we worry about supplying a net force on the body that counteracts gravity and a net torque on the body that servos it to level or upright. The Torque on the body is achieved by taking the legs that are in support, that is, are in contact with the ground, and controlling their hip torque to torque the body back to level. If you did control the hip torque with a foot that wasn't in contact with the ground, the leg would swing in the direction that the torque applied, and you wouldn't generate much of a torque on the torso. So you just use the stance legs, or we just use the stance legs, in order to uh, control the attitude of the body. And likewise, to control the uh, support forces, we use a, uh, a spring in the leg, in the lower parts of the leg, and adjust the force it exerts on the ground by manipulating the joints that are in series with it. So even though we don't have a series elastic actuator directly built into Big Dog, we achieve the same kind of result by using the uh, controlled degrees of freedom in concert with the passively springy degrees of freedom. Another key part of the balance and control of a robot like this is to control its lateral balance. 
it's actually it's forward balance as well, but it's easier to see for a narrow animal, <coughs> a narrow robot like this, uh, that when you talk about lateral. So suppose there's a disturbance applied or a lateral velocity applied uh, to the robot. In order to counteract that lateral velocity, the feet or some set of feet need to be positioned in a place where they can push back on the body. I mean, this is pretty simple, basic physics. And all we really do is calculate positions of the legs that counteract the lateral accelerations of the body. And we take into account the fact that when you swing a leg, you know, people like to think of legs as being approximately massless. But compared to the, uh, when, you, when you get a number of legs uh, working together with a, a compact torso, in fact, their mass is significant. So you need to uh, take into account what the inertial effects of uh, positioning those legs are. And we do sort of simultaneous equations on those things. Well, that's a simple run through of how you might break down those three sets of controls into a quadruped uh, robot. What happens when you go on rough terrain, which is really the goal of this robot? Well, there's a bunch of other things that we worry about. Uh, we worry about estimating what the shape of the terrain is so that when we're doing a stepping cycle, we can have some prediction of when the feet will get uh, will actually strike the ground. If you're climbing uphill, it's, it's a lot different effect than when you're going downhill in terms of when your feet will find the ground and how that, what effect that has on the dynamics of the traveling robot. So we use all the sensors in the legs in order to uh, sense and measure what the orientation of the terrain is with respect to the robot and then to uh, place the feet uh, at appropriate altitudes uh, to do that. We also keep track of kinematics and odometry. You know, many of you work on uh, wheeled robots, and you get odometry, meaning a measurement of the travel of the robot, by integrating the motion of the wheel. Well, we do exactly the same thing by integrating the motion of the legs, although we only can use the legs that are, that are in support in order to calculate the motion. So if you think of taking the legs that have a load on them, which you can measure, and then do reverse kinematics, plus the use of a gyroscope in the body that tells you the orientation of the body, you can easily calculate what the motion of the body is with respect to the foot, which you assume is not moving on the ground, and then just keep tracking that ahead. <coughs> so Big Dog keeps track of its motion through the world by using odometry on the legs that are in support. There's also a part of the control that worries about traction control. Uh, and really, the methods it uses aren't all that different than some of you have, those of you who have nice cars, high-end cars. They have traction control systems, which have uh, a computer looking at the relative motion of all the wheels. And if one wheel starts traveling, sp spinning faster than the other wheels, the computer infers that that wheel has lost traction. It actually separately applies a brake to that wheel so that the differential can deliver power to the other wheels and keep you going whether you're in, well, you guys aren't in snow out here, but when you're in the snow or the mud or whatever the slippery surface uh, situation is. And, you know, Big Dog does something very similar to that where it looks at the relative motions of the feet in support, and if it finds one leg that's slipping with respect to its knowledge from its inertial system plus its uh, other support legs, it can deliver the power to the other legs. And I'll show you a demo of that in an upcoming video. I already mentioned the reaction to the terrain. Um, another thing that the robot does is monitors how much power it's using, depending upon uh, whether it's being disturbed and the nature of the terrain, and generates more or less power from its, uh, from its engine and uh, powertrain. It, it's OK to let this video go through, OK? Um, this is a video that shows Big Dog uh, operating in the world. I'm sorry you don't hear the sound effects, but uh, it's noisy. It's much noisier than the video is anyway. Some of you may have seen some parts of this on YouTube, but I tried to put in some stuff that you haven't seen, so uh, uh, it should still be, have something in it. So he, um, here's Big Dog uh, walking through a park uh, near Boston Dynamics. It's uh, a park that uh, the local people fortunately let us use for testing, and it's climbing up a hill at about uh, 25 degrees. And here the robot's being disturbed uh, by uh, a guy who's not angry and he's not punishing the robot. He's just 
<coughs> pushing it so that all of you can see its control system reacting to the disturbance. So it uses its leg sensors and its gyro to detect the disturbance and then to react accordingly. Um, here's a, a part where Big Dog is, uh, you know, we just had it out for some other testing. We didn't know that there was ice that day and we inadvertently uh, drove it across this little patch of ice. And you get to see the uh, balance and control algorithms at work uh, <laughs> catching itself and uh, uh, getting back up on its feet and then uh, proceeding. Is it aware that it's using elbows? It's not aware. We didn't program anything for elbows. There's no load support on the elbows. It's something that I hate to say emergent behavior because I, really I don't really believe in that sort of thing. I believe in designers planning for what's going to happen. But, uh, you know, we got what we got. That, that side slip down the hill also, the, it gets pretty close to being down on its elbows, even though that wasn't the original uh, plan. Here Big Dog's going through some deep snow. And, and uh, it, here it's just climbing a hill with some shallow snow. And... Uh, I should say that for the ice, the snow, and you're going to see water, there's really no special programming. This is just uh, what the normal balance algorithms do. For this kind of muddy surface, the traction control plays a special role. This was uh, testing down at the Quantico Marine Corps base <coughs> where uh, part of our sponsors uh, ran us through some tests. And this was a day when there'd been some torrential rains and uh, uh, the day before, and we were out on a pretty muddy surface. And if you watch carefully, you'll see the feet slipping, uh, but it doesn't derail the robot or get it stuck. It can still transfer uh, traction and support to the other legs by keeping track of uh, what's working and what isn't. Um, the stride is limited by the steepness of train. Let me come back to that. If you remind me, I'll come back and say something about that. Um, here um, we have Big Dog in some water. It's about two, was started out about two feet deep and it's coming out. This is actually in uh, Thailand. Uh, uh, we went there for, it's hard to explain why we were there with Big Dog. <laughs> uh, this is Big Dog running with a, 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 still trotting, but here it's got a flight phase uh, where it gets entirely off the ground and we're really exercising those <coughs> springs that are in the lower leg. So some of the bouncing energy is recovered from the springs on each step. Uh, we've got, here it's going at about five miles an hour. We've had it up to about six and a half. Uh, we're still working on getting the controls to stabilize it when it's going at the faster speeds. Even though that parking lot looks flat, it's not flat from the point of view of a dynamic running robot. It's still very easy to stimulate the system to cause it to uh, derail. Here the robot's walking uh, using a, a slow moving walking gait um, to go over this simulated rubble pile. And uh, we've programmed up the legs so that they have a low output impedance which means that uh, they can move easily in response to the forces that the environment uh, exerts on it. Here we're showing that we have two working big dogs. Uh, there's nothing else to this clip uh, aside from it's kind of fun seeing them together. It's, it's, I love to imagine building um, seven or eight of them and either doing dog sledding with them or, uh, <laughs> or doing uh, the reindeer at uh, Christmas time and carrying <laughs> carrying Santa around on his sled. I think that would be uh, great fun. So th this is a little summary of the things that Big Dog has done so far. Uh, we've gone in terrain that's rocky, that's sandy, that's got uh, snow and mud and water. Um, we've operated it for just, I think, 12.8 miles is its maximum <coughs> distance without refueling or without any uh, human operator. Everything I've shown up till now, there's a human with a game controller that's, that's controlling the forward speed and the steering of the robot. And the robot does all its own balancing and stepping terrain assessment. Uh, for that run where it went uh, 13 miles, we had it following someone. And I'll show you a following clip uh, a little later. So there was not a, a driver. And it was really an endurance test, partly to it to see what we could do on one uh, load of fuel and partly to start pushing the reliability of the robot. You know, 12 miles isn't very much, uh, but it was a huge, uh, it felt like a huge accomplishment uh, for Big Dog. We had an original milestone of five miles and uh, uh, after some reliability engineering, we got it so it could do that regularly and then we moved it up and eventually got to that number. 
Uh, y you know, the, the mile, big dog's mileage is really pitiful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I don't know what it's, you know, it's like, uh, I can't remember if it's two gallons per mile or whether it's two miles per gallon. You know, something, something really, <laughs> truly pitiful. <laughs> I'm going to get to the energetics because it's an important, serious point. When we started this project, we were trying to get to show that we could pull a system together that would go any distance at all in, out in the real terrain. And you'll see in the follow-on program, which I'm going to get to in just a second, we've turned it around and start to address the questions of uh, what would it take to make this a practical system. Fuel is gasoline. This is gasoline. Something like that. Uh, the truth is, to do the long run, we filled the saddlebags with auxiliary tanks so yeah. that we would have enough fuel. So it weighed, I don't know, 300. The robot by itself weighs about 220 pounds. I think we had it around 350 pounds when it was all uh, carrying the load. So you should be able to, I don't know if that number's accurate, but something in that ballpark and you can back out. Um, now, you know that this is all funded by the, by the US military. And one of the questions that always comes up when you're dealing with the uh, US military is the question of weaponized robots. And uh, we have a big dog weaponization plan at Boston Dynamics. I know some of you aren't too happy about that, but I thought I'd show you what we've been doing. Uh, so we put uh, we put horns on the front of Big Dog. So could you turn off the uh, the video for this next clip? best behavior that is possible. We went through all our videos and found the best stuff. So I thought it's only fair to show you <coughs> some of the other video uh, that we have, but I asked them to turn off the recording because uh, we don't circulate <laughs> this stuff. So this is the simulated rubble pile, and uh, wouldn't you know it, but uh, Big Dog would, uh, uh, would find an opportunity to get its foot stuck. But obviously, we're showing off that Big Dog is pretty tolerant of the terrain, even dynamically changing <laughs> terrain. Here's um, a clip where we're working on getting the jogging uh, perfected. <laughs> and it's interesting that it could go so wrong, uh, but then those uh, balance algorithms are pretty powerful. And at least in this case, um, it, uh, it saved itself. It now. If uh, I have you guys heard of Boston drivers? <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> Somehow one got into the lab that day and took over the controls. I'm sorry, I'll get to your question in a second. Um, this is another case on the ice, and Big Doug does a valiant effort to keep it even here. It's still got its feet under itself and is balancing, but then at this point it popped the radiator, uh, popped an actuator hose. And it really can't do much without uh, all the actuators. This is um, one of our engineers in training. <laughs> we, we, we let him go. <laughs> Big Dog has a thing for trees. Sometimes it meets its match. <laughs> Uh, here's Big Dog doing Tai Chi. It looks, it looks like Tai Chi. <laughs> so, you know, we try and design these robots to take uh, a fair amount of abuse. I think, I think one of our uh, strategic advantages as a company is to plan that every day we take the robot out, we're going to break it and we're going to fix it. I don't know how many labs I've been to where everybody is so careful and it's practically worshiping on an altar their, their apparatus. And as a result, I think it's a real limitation to how much work they can get done and how much they can learn about it. And by uh, beating it to death like we do, or sometimes to death and sometimes we just make it stronger so uh, you, know, you can pick it up and do the next experiment, uh, you really uh, uh, learn a lot. Not yet, and I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about that. Do you do you wanna? Yeah, I had a question. It, it 
looks like the legs both you know have a, a, a uh, the same form. It looks like uh, they're organized to run forwards and backwards rather than uh, forwards only with back as being a, uh, a much. So much we treatment. we if you look at me when I uh, when I bend over like this, um, you know my elbows are are folding back and my knees are folding forward. And in very simple terms, that's the kind of symmetry we built into that version of Big Dog. And you can look at the animal kingdom of quadrupeds and even birds and find that symmetry if you look for it. But if you look in the animal kingdom, you can also find other things going on. For instance, an ostrich. It looks like ostriches run with their back legs and the knee going the wrong way. But if you look at the anatomy carefully, you find out that that knee is really their ankle. They have a foot that's this long, and the th part that looks like a foot on the ground is the toe. Yeah. Now, who am I to say that that's a toe? You know, uh, if you do the homologous matching, that's the conclusion you come to. But they're really just names. Um, oh, the other thing about the ostrich is they have another joint up that is hidden by the feathers. So if you look, you can find all kinds of structures. From a kinematic point of view, I don't think it matters. And uh, later on, I have a picture where we have Big Dog climbing with the legs reversed. And we just took them off, mounted them the other way, because we had a kinematic interference problem when it was climbing a steep hill. And it just doesn't matter kinematically. Now, someday when we make this robot work um, where it's energetically swinging the legs using so-called passive dynamic techniques, um, then some additional things will matter, and maybe we'll have to use a, a link structure that, uh, that kind of dovetails with that kind of control. But I don't think it matters as much as folks think. So I understand four legs good, two legs bad. <laughs> uh, but what about other numbers? Sorry, sorry that? I understand four legs good, two legs bad, which is from Orwell. Oh, but oh. Um, six legs, eight legs were other numbers examined, and this was found to be optimal? Uh, no. We just picked four. We, as, a, as an organization, and in my previous life, we've looked at all sorts of stuff. So we've done one-legged things. The purpose of a one-legged thing was to force you to go to the dynamic extreme. So we had one leg with a small foot. The thing bounced. Uh, I c after the talk, I can show you videos of that if you like, or you can look online. Um, and that really was great for forcing us to think. Y y you know, I think if you look back in history, you'll see that the beginning of legged locomotion tried to assume the legged thing was like a table, you know? And that if you have a broad base of support and always kept at least a tripod on the ground, or you used big feet that, that provided the base of support, then your only job was to keep the center of mass over that support point. And I just think that's the wrong way to come at the problem. Instead, you want to be come from, from, you know, point zero thinking, how am I going to manage the kinetic energy in the system to successfully keep myself balanced? And it's a really, it's a different mindset that gets you to a different set of solutions. And, uh, you know, it's what we always try and do. I, I know I diverged from your question about numbers of legs. You know, we've built uh, some simplified six-legged things, uh, both for climbing and walking. Uh, we ha I'm going to show you a biped that we're working on right now, which is a human form thing. Um, I think it's a secondary question. I think if you can get these control principles uh, and, uh, you know, the mechanical design think principles right, you can make it work on all sorts of structures. And you should, what you really need is an application and maybe you can work back to what was optimum for it. Yeah? Into the legs. Which like kind? Which are sensors, like cameras into each leg, so this thing can actually see where it's stepping. Um, I, I think it could make sense. Um, uh, I don't know if I have much to say on it. I think it could make sense. You know, we're starting to add sensors that aren't quite in the legs, but are, you know, near here, looking right in front. Um, we did have uh, range sensors in the legs for a short time, although there were practical problems that made it hard to keep them working. Uh, but uh, uh, I, I think sensing can do a lot. Our basic approach, so everything I've shown you so far doesn't have vision except for the human driver's vision. And I think getting the robot to work at this level of performance, where it reacts quickly to disturbances, where it can sense variations in the terrain, is a great platform upon which to add more sensing. And you're going to see, I'm going to talk about uh, sensing the environment and then building on that. But I think it was better to do this layer uh, proprioceptively and then build on that, rather than rely from day one on 
mapping the terrain, planning trajectories that did footholds or anything like that, which might be the other approach, which I'm afraid a lot of the manipulation world is, is doing as well. And I think, in other words, the, the, the approach is to uh, sense the environment, model it, figure out traject you know, do kinematics to figure out trajectories, and then execute. And I would, I would really like to see a more reactive uh, uh, type approach if possible and then maybe build up the sensing on top and the modeling on top of it. Slip history in the algorithm for control. Um, if you detect that you have slip on this surface recently, switch algorithm versus uh, a surface which is tight grip, uh, go ahead with a more aggressive algorithm. Do you switch algorithm at all? We, we don't switch uh, so far. We, we should. There's a bunch of stuff we should do that we haven't done yet. Like we should... Uh, uh, have some sort of settings for how rough the terrain is and have the gate optimized if it's smooth. If you, know, if you watch a person, in fact, I'll show a demo at the end where you have a person walking on something flat. Man, their feet just skim over, our feet just skim over the surface as long as it's flat. As soon as it gets rough, we, we kind of change modes and, and act where we move our feet more Ditto up and down. Ditto on ice, right. We don't want to have any, uh, tan any tangential forces on ice, so we keep our legs stiff. Uh, you or someone over here asked about uh, if the stride was shorter in climbing. That's uh, the result of a kinematic limitation uh, that when you tip the body, you consume degree, some degree of freedom and the legs just can't travel as far. Uh, in that. And we're working on fixing that in the next design because it's really a, a limitation. Stride about, what, 14, inches? Uh, you know, I don't know, but that sounds about right. So let me go ahead. What programming language do you use? And to what extent are you using a neural network? Uh, I would say close to zero neural network. It, you know, this is all hand programmed using C++. Uh, you know, basically engineers in the trenches programming everything. You know, a related question that Sebastian was on my case about uh, earlier in the week was, you know, could we use learning to tune up some of these behaviors? And I, and I think we could but we, we haven't. We've been trying to say, what are the broad strokes? Uh, let's get into the ballpark of a solution, and then, you know, if we, if we can, maybe we'll work on uh, optimization. We do do some, a little bit of, uh, I don't want to call it learning or neural nets, but for figuring out where the center of the mass of the robot is to kind of null out some of the effects of, uh, of uh, where the feet are placed, because, you know, we load it up different ways, different times. But it's pretty, pretty simple-minded. Yeah? I'm curious how many lines of code code is I don't know. Uh, I, 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 you know, I think of the programming as not being the essential hard thing. Uh, I don't know if that's fair. I mean, we have, we have, when we talk about what we're doing and what we're trying to do, we never talk about the programming. Now, that might be that the guys are all... Uh, no, I don't want to hear about it or protecting me from it. But I don't think that the software and the software management is a big deal. You know, this runs on an ordinary PC, as I said. Of course, that doesn't say how many lines of code there are. Well, I mean, so would you say that, like, between two or three engineers, there, there, there's some small number of people who basically really understand the whole system? Or is it large enough that, like, nobody can come close to understanding? <laughs> it, it, it's a good question, actually. Um, in terms of the balancing and dynamic control and the locomotion controls uh, you know people there are multiple people at the company who understand a lot about it and you know one person can understand it but if you then start to look at the systems for doing the bookkeeping of the engines and the hydraulics there's guys who know more about that uh, there's also uh, you know kinematic routines that other guys develop and there's a lot of back and forth but it's sort of provided as a utility to the to the controls guys then there's perception stuff, which is sort of a different bailiwick. Um, we do have a bigger team than two or three working on the controls for this, although for any one activity, it's, it's something like that. I suggest we proceed with the talk. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, I don't remember what this next thing is, uh, so I'll just do it. Oh, <laughs> what's next? That's good. <laughs> so we have a new project from DARPA to build the legged squad support system, so-called. That's their name. We're, we're going to try and think up something friendlier than that. Uh, but whereas this is, supported, this is funded by DARPA and the Marine Corps. 
So Big Dog came out of a program that was biologically inspired robots, biodynotics. And the idea, and uh, you know, the, when they put out their RFP, they just said, propose things that are biologically inspired. We proposed Big Dog, which was gonna be a, 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 a quadruped, animal-like thing. Other people proposed uh, uh, elephant trunk-like manipulator. Um, Mark <coughs> Kowski and uh, uh, Dan Kodachek and others proposed a climbing thing. Uh, which turned into the RISE project. It was going to be a gecko-like thing and turned into the, the RISE project. So they were everywhere. Now that Big Dog is kind of in DARPA's viewfinder, they, they sort of switched tack and said, well, where would you t how far could you take this capability if you wanted to really do a mission, a quote, a mission? And they, ga and they came up with a program where they had a bunch of specs. And this is much more narrowly focused on trying to achieve those specs by moving the robot ahead. And the kind of things they're looking are for are carrying a payload of about 400 pounds. Uh, if you took a, a, a Marine Corps squad, that's uh, 50 pounds for each of eight guys. Or it could be a casualty plus all his gear might be something like three or 400 pounds. They want it to be able to go on a 20 mile range uh, without re needing refueling or, or any other real attention. Um, they wanted agile, I just put in the word agile as a bookmark to mean the kind of rough terrain that we're showing and, and more if we can achieve it. Um, you know, if you've listened to Big Dog videos, you know it makes noise, but the videos really don't do it justice because it's much worse uh, <laughs> than it sounds. And so one of the goals is to make Big Dog, uh, or big, make LS3 uh, plausibly quiet. Um, and also to self-write. Someone was asking before, it, can Big Dog get up when it falls down? It cannot, and I'll say a couple of words about that in a minute. And so one of our goals is to do that. Now, if you look at Big Dog and this list, it might seem like we're close, but I want to tell you that we're not. Uh, Big Dog did carry 320 pounds, in our, uh, 340 pounds uh, across our parking lot. But it can only carry about 100 pounds when it's going up uh, a hiking trail. Um, Big Dog went 12.8 <coughs> miles, but it did that with no load. It did it on the flat. Uh, so when you start taking, and, and also Big Dog makes a ton of noise, and you know, you're going to have to, uh, although you don't have to use weight for all that quieting, a lot of it's going to come from adding weight for mufflers and other kinds of enclosures and things. So when you go to all those corners and try and do all these things at one time, it's really uh, quite a substantial challenge from, uh, from where we are today. Uh, we put together a team to help us do this project. So Boston Dynamics is the lead. Bell Helicopter has a, a really sophisticated group of hydraulics designers and, uh, uh, that they use in their vertical takeoff, their Osprey and uh, uh, the 609 and, and other cool stuff. Uh, and we have other teammates, uh, NREC and uh, slash CMU and JPL are doing the perception system uh, for LS3, I won't go through everybody. Yeah. All the noise comes from the fact that you use a two-stroke gasoline engine. If you had a different energy source, that could power then an Just hold on one more slide, and I'll, <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll say what you just said, right? Um, so what are the big challenges? And you know, this is almost the same list as the, the light at the end of the tunnel that I mentioned at the beginning. Um, the, uh, one is the energy efficiency. Um, energy efficiency translates into having a lighter machine that can do the same performance. Um, coming up with a, a leg and body architecture that can deal with the rough terrain, but also get itself up when, it's, uh, when, it, when it falls down, uh, uh, and that has the, the strength and reliability is another one of the challenges. Getting the noise under control and then finally, terrain perception, which is probably the tallest <coughs> pole in the tent, depending upon what your demands are. So I'm just going to sort of show where we are on each of these things. Uh, the red line here shows if you took the efficiency level of all the various systems in Big Dog and just scaled it up to dealing with a 400-pound payload, assuming that before we could handle a 100-pound payload, um, that's how it scales. And it's pretty ugly scaling if you want to go out to 20, uh, a 20-mile 20 range. Um, 
And I didn't say it before, but there's a constraint on the overall size of the system that DARPA wants to accept. They want it to be about 1,000 pounds, which includes the 400-pound <coughs> payload and the fuel uh, and the, the robot itself. So you can see we're, we're over budget there. And the, these other lines represent higher efficiency implementations of the system. So what does uh, higher efficiency implementation mean? There's really three targets that we're working on. One target is, uh, this is a specific fuel consumption plot for a car engine. Um, so I just got this off the web. And basically the concept is that if you operate at peak power, you're out here and you don't get the maximum efficiency. But if you operate at a higher torque but lower RPM, you can get into that red spot where the engine for the, for the amount of power per time uses the least fuel. And we need to do that for, uh, for LS3 and we're working on that. Um, another place to save energy is in the hydraulic system. Uh, the kind of hydraulic system we use is like a li has linear amplifiers at each actuator. And you know a linear amplifier, if you operate it at less than the peak uh, power, you're throwing away large amounts of power in the internal resistances of the valve. And in hydraulic systems, basically you heat oil at orifices, and then not only do you have to spend energy heating the oil, you, then you have to cool the oil. So you actually spend, pay for that twice. And so we are looking at various schemes. I'm not going to go into exactly what they are, but uh, various ways of valving the fluid in the hydraulic system and in constructing the actuators that minimizes the energetic cost for delivering a certain amount of work. Now part of the solution here is also to do the controls in a way that operates the hydraulics at its sweetest spots, which means not, not necessarily using the simplest kinds of dynamic locomotion controls, but operating in places where the hydraulics are happy. And then the third general area is on the locomotion control itself. Um, any of you who are involved in legged robotics, and I don't know how many there are here, I know there's Ken Waldron's group, but the, and there must be some others, know that there's a whole area of research called uh, passive dynamic walking where the idea is to take advantage of the uh, compound pendulum-like effect of a leg. And there have been some simple uh, legged systems built that if they're on a, on a shallow incline, will walk, meaning pick up a leg, swing it forward, place it back down again, pick up the next leg, swing it forward, place it down again, with next to zero energy consumption. And it's believed that people and animals use techniques like this. That is, that we use the fact that our muscles will let our joints swing freely <coughs> without using power. And then our brain kind of just tweaks along, uh, the, our brain and muscles tweak along our limbs so that we're using these kind of passive motions. The good news is that people working in that area have made some very exciting progress. There's a group at Cornell that has a robot that on some very small batteries has traveled, uh, I think it's close to 10, 10 kilometers, six miles, uh, on a flat terrain, on, uh, you know, on a, uh, a running track. The bad news is that these robots have no capability to exert large forces, to react to disturbances, and to do things like climbing. Big Dog is more at the very high power end of things, but it doesn't really have any efficiency. So, a, a task, a goal, would be to combine, or make hybrids do rough terrain locomotion with high bandwidth performance some of the time, but also be able to do passive dynamic uh, coasting type behavior. We're working on that problem, but I will give it as an assignment to all of you people here, you people who are doing design and computer, uh, uh, computer uh, science and controls and algorithms, that there's a very rich problem here and a challenge to solve, and I hope you'll all go work on it and uh, I hope you tell me about when you get some uh, good results. Um, I'm probably, is there a clock here? Okay. Um, yeah, I, I saw. I'll try and wrap up in about uh, a few minutes here. Um, big dog looks like this. And the reason it can't self-write it, can't self-write, is because with the legs totally tucked up under itself, it's center of mass is substantially elevated over its feet. So there's potential energy 
uh, in the robot when it's on its feet. And when it lies on its side, its feet are, uh, its, its center of mass is lower. So to get from that side position to up onto its feet requires a big uh, elevation. Now, um, I wanted to do a demonstration. I used Sebastian last time. Okay, Ken Salisbury, would you, would you help me would do a demonstration? <laughs> I'm not going to kick him. <laughs> Could you could you lie down on the floor here? <laughs> this payback time marker. Yeah, this is payback time. <laughs> could you lie down on the floor? On your side. Okay. With your arms and feet towards the audience. Good. And lie down all the way. Yeah, that's good. Okay. Now would you get back up? <laughs> Go ahead. Very good. Okay. <laughs> you notice that Ken didn't have any trouble doing that at all. <laughs> and um, we, we could um, videotape and analyze, which we've done with some of us. And uh, you know, one of the common techniques, uh, so I'll put on this video, you can start watching. One of the common techniques for doing that in a human is to use your spine, which is a degree of freedom that lets you rotate the arms separately from the legs. And what you can do is uh, shift your weight to your legs, even though they're on the side. Get your arms underneath yourself by twisting, then pick up, and then get your legs underneath yourself. So in the upper left there, this video uh, shows a simulation of a robot that's just like Big Dog, except it has an added degree of freedom that allows it to differentially use the front legs and the rear legs to get them under itself. In this case, it's using its uh, you know, uh, like kinetic energy. Yeah, I don't think Ken did that, but he could. <laughs> he, do you want to try again? <laughs> um, for LS3, we're looking at some other things. We're looking at uh, a leg design that mounts the legs on the side of the body uh, so that the feet can be placed very high up with respect to the bottom of the robot so that uh, you don't have to actually elevate the robot in order to get the feet under it. And the other thing that's required is to have a, a very large range of motion in the shoulders, much larger than any of the robots we've built so far. I call it a shoulder. It's either a shoulder or a hip. And uh, that allows it to scoot its arms uh, or legs around to, uh, even though they're sticking out to the side, to get them in so they can get under it and then to elevate. So it looks like we have the beginning of a solution. I think once you get onto inclined terrain with bushes and rocks, this is still going to be quite a challenge. Uh, but we're uh, looking forward to tackling it. What? <laughs> Yeah, and, and with a load, is I, it may have to jettison the load in order to do that. Um, we're looking at leg designs that have a much larger range of motion, uh, which allow you to stay away from the limits of the leg and get larger stride, like you were asking about before. This is a, uh, a workspace diagram. Those of you guys who design stuff will, will sort of know this diagram. But this is in the sagittal plane. And the green thing is the big dog leg. You can see it's a very small. You'd like a big volume. You'd really like a big volume with strong forces. So this doesn't show forces, but we, we also look at that. And then there's a proposed LS3 design that has that larger volume. And the fact that the diagrams contain these obstacles is sort of a measure of how good they are. You'd, the bigger uh, the area, the uh, more obstacles you should theoretically be able to negotiate uh, with the design. And so we're working all these things right now. This is a demo for noise. No. That's Big Dog. This is uh, a, an electrically powered Big Dog, where the engine is replaced with a, uh, a motor from a motorcycle, actually, electric motorcycle. So the good news is that um, you can make it a lot quieter that way. The bad news is you have to carry around this gigantic battery, which is only good for about 10 minutes. So in this configuration, the robot can do many of the things it could do under gasoline power. It's slightly underpowered. You know, there's a kick. It's going to go uphill. Um, and we are contemplating possibly building a hybrid version of LS3 where you can have small duration, like 10 minutes, of quiet operation. It'll also have enclosures to eliminate the remaining uh, uh, sound if we, if we end up going that way. Um, autonomy um, is the next element which I think of as a tall pole in the tent. Uh,
for military use, they don't really want to have a person dedicated to driving the robot all the time. They'd like to have the robot tag along. And so we've been uh, developing, uh, using sensors on the robot to uh, track a person and follow them. Oh, sorry, I got the wrong way there. So uh, here's a, uh, a demo where we're using a sick LADAR. It's looking at a reflective stripe on that leader. Every time it gets a, uh, a reading on the leader, it uh, transforms the coordinate back into its own coordinate system. And it puts together a path through space. So the leader can actually weave in and out of trees, and the robot will go along the same path. Here, the robot's doing all its own balancing and control. So when it's going uphill and downhill, the robot's doing everything. Um, our engineer, Kevin there, says it's really scary to have the robot right behind you like that going downhill. <laughs> And you saw it go tumbling downhill before, right? So it could happen right now. But, uh, but he's uh, a trooper. And uh, <laughs> you notice that the robot's kind of waiting here. It's getting its uh, grip on the ground. And uh, it's still tracking the leader and uh, going to follow where he went when it proceeds. And we're starting to experiment with uh, <coughs> using uh, sensors, doing the kind of things that more of you people do for the uh, urban and grand challenges, where here we're doing slam on the trees using the laser. Uh, the Jet Propulsion Lab is doing stereo with us, and here a very short-range uh, stereo pair is looking right in front of the robot uh, to look for obstacles. The thought is that if you're tracking at a couple of meters, you can probably just go exactly where the leader goes. But they want us to be able to track at 30 or 50 meters, and there's just uh, a huge challenge. Just in doing the odometry and knowing where the guy was with any precision once you get there means you're going to be off by some. And so the local sensing is a, is a, we're hoping to be able to use it to be able to keep it on the, uh, uh, the narrow parts of the terrain. Um, we could do that too, and we may. Uh, we've, we've been looking at some of the, um, the odometry systems, you know, based on an accelerometer on the, on the leader, accelerometer on the shoe of the leader that uh, we might do. Um, um, we, we've talked to people who do that. You know, the Sarnoff guys have a really cool system where the leader has a helmet with cameras that does feature recognition and tracking. Then there's a radio, and then the follower uh, tracks the same, you know, matches the same uh, features. And it, it looks interesting. You know, we don't know exactly how we're going to solve it yet, but, but this is the problem. What happens when one piece of the system fails? You know... Uh, you know, big dog goes down when you shoot off a leg. Uh, you know, we haven't done anything to make it redundant uh, or to, to make it survivable of that kind of stuff. I think that's going to have to come in a, in a next phase or uh, some other phase. I have one more thing I want to show. I'm going to skip this. This just shows some of the problems uh, that are related to the terrain sensing and autonomy problem, but I think you guys probably know more about this than, than we do anyway. Uh, we, I have w we have one more robot that we've been working on lately which is a human form robot. It's designed to uh, test clothing, uh, protective clothing. And there's really a desire on the, uh, on the Army's part to have it move very much the way uh, a person moves so that they can get the accurate stressing and straining of the, of the clothing. We're also actually having to control the temperature and humidity and uh, the, the robot sweats to simulate the microenvironment inside the the clothing. So there's a, there's a lot of things going on. Um, this is a video that uh, uh, shows um, where we are with this project. Uh, in order to get a quick start on the controls, we uh, built a, uh, a set of the sort of the bottom half of the robot. We used big dog legs for most of it, although the lower leg and the foot are um, specifically designed for this. And we've been working on the controls trying to get a more human style of walking than, uh, than we've seen in a legged robot. And here, uh, Gabe Nelson, one of the real brains behind our controls group, is uh, disturbing it. Uh, uh, we haven't learned how to disturb it as vigorously as Big Dog yet, but we'll, we'll work on that. And here you can see that the robot is landing on its heel, as humans, somewhat like humans do, um, and then uh, pushing off on its toe. It is, and I'll show you how much. Could I ask the projection people to turn off the video uh, now? 
Um, so fortunately, you know, we have some constraints on what we're allowed to show. So I'm, I'm willing to show you guys, but they're going to record it and, and uh, post some of the stuff. So that's why we have to turn it off. So here's some, uh, some unvarnished truth. Big Dog's kind of an ornery, I mean, Pet Man's an ornery character uh, <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> Our guys are on their feet, eh? <laughs> I think Big Dog had a, a long, I mean, Pet Man had a long night uh, just before <laughs> that, <laughs> don't I think. <laughs> We've been trying to look, at least informally, at how much Pet Man's gait really is like a human. So here's a person, <coughs> and here's Pet Man superimposed. And you know, sort of the pace of the gait and the stride are very similar. But you notice that the robot picks up its foot a little bit more. It's not uh, willing to just have the feet skim the ground. And here's a little Turing test. Uh, <laughs> un unfortunately, we don't do very well in the Turing test, do we? <laughs> so we're, we're right in the, um, in the midst of designing the rest of the robot. On the left there is CAD of uh, the whole thing. Uh, it's going to have arms uh, and legs. It's a very complicated robot. I'm scared to death of the robot. One of the, th one of the things I'm afraid of is the uncanny valley. You know, when the robot looks just exactly the same size and shape as a person, which we're required to do for this program, uh, but it has fewer degrees of freedom and not as sophisticated controls, it's going to be hard for it not to look stupid, I think. Uh, so I, I think I've diligently steered away from making a robot just like a person or animal. And you can really uh, win that way because people see a little bit of animation in it and they, and they <coughs> say, yeah, it's alive. But if you get too close to the animal, like you just saw in that Turing test, um, you know, you can, you can fail again. Um, we have a lot of other robotics going on at the company. Uh, I want to tell you about one other problem we have at Boston Dynamics. We have this unbelievable crew of robotics people. You can see we have about 40 robotics people. But there's something missing. Can anybody? Uh, Stanford. Uh, nope. Stanford isn't on that list. So we have an affirmative action program. <laughs> and I am here today to solicit you to either come yourselves or send your students or whoever to come at least apply for a job at Stanford. Uh, we are hiring and uh, we need uh, you know, all manner of roboticists, simulation people, mechanical designers, uh, electronics, controls. I hope you will send someone. Um, I don't know if you guys want to broadcast this part or not. These are all pirated from YouTube, but you can decide yourself. Uh, I just thought I'd do one more Turing test. Uh, I assume most of you have seen this. This is a reverse Turing test. The Turing test says, is the con creation um, really a person or not? And this is, is the creation really big dog or not? The real, the real genius of this is the soundtrack, <laughs> uh, which is that you know it's th they pirated our soundtrack and then superimposed it. <laughs> now I want to I want to close with just one more comment. I you know I used to be a professor and when and when I was a professor. We, I used to, uh, here, I'm going to stop this because otherwise you won't, you won't listen to me. You can go watch this on YouTube yourselves if you want. When I was a professor, I used to uh, count my publications and citations. Uh, but now I'm not a professor, and there's a new metric. And the new metric is um, how many views we get on YouTube and how many spoofs of Big Dog we get. And that's, that's my method of citation. So I thought I would just show you that there are people around the world spoofing Big Dog. The upper left is in uh, Tokyo, including Akihabara. Uh, the upper right is uh, LA. There's a television, an online television show called uh, uh, Q4 TV. <laughs> this is, I assume this is Appalachia. I don't know really where it is. But uh, they do Big Dog. And uh, this is uh, somewhere in, this, in the former Soviet Union, I'm told. And there's uh, about 10 more. And uh, you can see them by going to, uh, if you go to uh, YouTube slash Boston Dynamics, we have them all favorited on there. 
or I'll send them to you. Thanks. You know, for, we do have the desire on our sponsors to hit temperatures. Yeah. And part of our strategy in getting Bell Helicopter and AAI, you know, AAI is UAVs, Bell Helicopter does air, man rated aircraft. They have so much experience with that, we hope they're going to help our group, which doesn't have any experience with it, uh, tackle those things. So they already know so much about that. You know, we do, even in our existing work, we, we worked, you know, around the year. Uh, in all seasons in Boston. Oh, that's what I forgot to say for the affirmative action program. I will offer anybody who takes a job in Boston snow plowing for one year <laughs> if you come take a job at our place. Oh, oh, Sorry, I forgot. What? Even in the operations we've done so far, we do oil heating in the winter. Um, and, you know, of course, the cooling of everything in the summer is, I didn't mention it, but it's probably the biggest challenge so far is making the system so it can run steady state in the heat because there's so much uh, inefficiency, essentially. You know, all the work that comes out of the engine goes into cooled something because there's no place else for it to go, really. Afghanistan, Afghanistan has very, dim you know, there's high altitude. What was the second part of your question? Speculate on the future of the trade-offs between this class of robot and the robots we've deployed, the rovers rather, on uh, Moon and Mars. Well, rather than directly answer that, I think there's great potential for hybrid vehicles that are combinations of active suspensions, which are leg-like, and wheels. Uh, you know, wheels that would allow high-efficiency travel where the terrain is flat, but negotiate rubble and uh, other kinds of obstacles where it's not by using the uh, automated, you know, high performance active suspension. I don't think anybody's really pushed it as far as they could. Most of the active suspensions are very simple things, uh, and I think there's great potential there. So that's not exactly an answer, but uh, it's the closest. Yeah? Yeah. Now yeah. 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 he's finding his way into the public sector, like, I don't know, two cases that walk. Um, Maybe the ability for wheelchairs to go downstairs. Um, possibly even, um, in my case, is for some reason I couldn't have my drive job somehow replacing that with a mechanical uh, walking computer. You know, people have made uh, uh, research projects in each of the directions you mentioned. Uh, in Japan, there's a uh, Meldog, which is a robot that uh, uh, is designed to uh, uh, aid a, a blind person looking for the curbs and, and things like and, and uh, things like that. Um, I don't know if it ever got developed to the point where it could be, uh, you know, used out in the world, but there, but it was studied. Another thing is that Dean Kamen, uh, the guy who both builds the uh, Segway and uh, also uh, prosthetic uh, limbs, has a, a wheelchair that has a, a mechanism that can do stairs. And it's, uh, it's a balancing wheelchair, so it's very interesting. It balance on, uh, I don't know if it's one wheel or a pair of wheels. I think it's a pair of wheels. Uh, but it can alternate that pair of wheels with other wheels in order to go up and down stairs. I've seen live demos of it, and it's very, it's, uh, very compelling. I don't believe, he's, I know he's been wanting to commercialize it, but I don't know the current status. So I think, you know, the broad answer to your question is I think there are opportunities for this kind of technology to, to go into that kind of space. Uh, prosthetics is another one. Now, the, you know, DARPA has a big program to do uh, prosthetic arms. I don't believe they're doing legs uh, yet, but there are other people uh, uh, who are working on that. Is there any thought to separating locomotion from load bearing? 
towing a sledge or uh, something like that so you don't have to carry all the weight up high? Um, it's a great idea. You know, I have a video of, uh, of one of our early robots. Uh, um, here, let me see if I can find it uh, while we're, where we're talking here. Um, I don't think I'm going to be able to do this. I'll show it to you after. Um, where we're pulling, where we got a, uh, 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 a tr what is it called when you, uh, the wagon that goes behind a trotting racing horse? A, uh, a chariot. What? It's like a chariot. Uh, what? Yeah, okay, I'm thinking, trying to think of it. Anyway, we, we have uh, used one of our early uh, balancing biped robots to pull two people plus some other equipment, you know, so 400 pounds. And uh, it's remarkable what it can do if, if you're on the flat, right? Because what? It, it's like it looks like a rickshaw. I, I, there's still another word I'm trying to think of. I'm sorry, I can't. can't get it. Well, I think if we do casualty extraction, you know, the idea that you're going to get a guy onto the thing is probably not right. But dragging him on a stretcher makes a lot of sense. One last question. We're right over here. Your control is it centralized or is it distributed? That is, do, we, do you make local decisions in the joint and then have some <coughs> collection which directs those local decisions, or do you have a single set of Well, in terms of the hardware itself, in Big Dog there was one computer. In, the, in LS3 there's going to be a CAN bus, but the locomotion will happen on one computer. There are servos at the joints that are low level that can be independent, that get instructions. But the locomotion, the part where we divide it into support, balance, and, uh, and posture, that's probably going to continue to be a centralized type of uh, a centralized calculation. There's nothing all that daunting about the calculations. We, we put a lot of the work up front to make those simple enough so that you know, it's, it's not a big deal. All right. So if you like this talk, go home and make a spoof. Okay. <laughs> all right. All right. All right. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.